Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bharti, and welcome to TFI Insights. Today, we have two guests joining us virtually, Ian Hood, Chief Technologist, Global Service Provider Business Unit at Red Hat, and Renu Noble, Vice President and GM of Intel's Edge Computing and Ecosystem Enabling Division. Renu, Ian, it's good to have you on the show. Uh, thanks so much for having us. Go ahead, Renu. It's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Red Hat and Intel have announced plans to expand their, I mean, you two have been working together for so long. You're expanding your partnership, uh, looking at this new wave of uh, 5G technology that are coming in. So what I want to understand, Renu, if you can, Please start. If you look at 5G today, it, it means different things from how we look at it. You know, if you look at the consumer space, everybody is talking about you know uh, 5G phones, and yes, we have 5G on our devices also. But then uh, I think last year the the government also released some spectrum which has kind of democratized 5G, where companies can build a lot of net networks and a lot of devices. So, from your perspective, how do you see evolution of 5G? after the whole uh, you know, release of um, spectrum for, for, for consumption of both commercial entities. And they have also made it cheaper also. You don't have to spend millions of dollars to get access to 5G network. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Swapnil, great question. So Intel has been driving leadership in 5G for a few years now. Um, 5G is not only about you know, making sure your devices are 5G capable or ensuring we have enough 5G spectrum, uh, but it's also about making sure that we have the network infrastructure that is you know, updated or re, uh, reinvigorated in order to handle uh, 5G in addition to potentially even 4G. Um, so not only should the network infrastructure be transformed, become more cloudified. Uh, it needs to be flexible and automated in order to have a very seamless experience from the cloud to the edge, through the network, and deliver the best type of applications and services and experiences to the 5G enabled devices. So we've been working with the, the networking industry, our communication service providers, and a number of the, 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 you know, the value chain ecosystem for a few years now in order to enable and get the whole industry ready for the 5G infrastructure. Yeah. Uh... Open source or software is playing a very big role. Even you know before 5G, uh, all those big telcos they were leveraging all those open source technologies uh, to build their next generation of uh, network. Uh, all the networks today are software defined. What role is open source and software playing in this um, revolution that we are seeing in the context of 5G? Well, I guess the uh, easiest way to answer that is that um, open source is the innovation for almost every technology and applies to the entire, every layer of the stack. So now we've gone from you know, building cloud native platforms that we can put these applications on, the APIs that we use to actually you know, manage and control it, you know, right down to how we actually um, software enable the hardware underneath, right? And that's where we're doing a lot of good work with Intel in not just the service assurance pieces, but also in the, how do we actually drive the hardware underneath using open source? And this way, you know, it extends now all the way from not just the 5G core, where we've done that um, for LTE, we've done that for quite some time now, but we're now evolving and expanding to what they call open RAN, which is the radio interfaces, the cloud platform, and the orchestration of those to enable that 5G highway to be built on top of open source technologies and further enable us to put open source technologies for those enterprise edge applications that Renu talked about that live on top of the 5G highway. Thanks, thanks for explaining that. And now that also a very good segue to understand this partnership, uh, the expansion of the partnership between these two companies. So either Renu or Ian, you can pick up to, uh, uh, to just talk a bit about uh, what does this partnership look like? Uh, what does this expansion look like? So the, the partnership uh, with Red Hat and Intel, I mean, it builds on our, um, you know, several years of partnership. 
um, it's really looking at it from three ways, right? One is we, we want to continue to accelerate um, you know, the uh, evolution of this cloud native infrastructure for 5G and Edge. So jointly with Red Hat, how do we ensure that our technologies as well as all the um, you know, cable products and services that Red Hat has like OpenShift uh, and others, how do we use that to accelerate 5G and Edge? That's one. Second is, you know, um, like Ian was mentioning, you know, there's a number of open source technologies that is critical in order to expose the technology innovations that we have. So how do we, you know, make sure that our technology innovations get upstreamed faster into the open source projects? And how do they then get commercialized by, by Red Hat as well as deployed commercialized and supported and deployed in production environments. So we want to accelerate that whole upstream to commercialization pro uh, process. And then the third is both Intel and Red Hat have to work with a very wide ecosystem, very, uh, you know, our value chain is, uh, you know, pretty vast. And how do we ensure that we partner deeply with, you know, several members of our value chain ecosystem, make sure that we are accelerating their time to market uh, and then ensuring that they are then able to deploy again their solutions and their products on the Intel plus Red Hat technologies, which in turn helps our customers like our communication service providers, the telco op or, or telco operators, as well as the enterprises, it helps them address their operational challenges. It helps them lower their operational costs and then partner with, you know, it, they have a choice of the vendor ecosystem that they can then use for production deployments. That's a good, uh, good start there, I know you've covered most of the things. Um, so why don't we kind of add to that sort of the, um, the key things that we kind of put together in terms of, you know, APIs for OpenStack and OpenShift, both the, you know, VM-based solutions that people are deploying versus the, you know, cloud-native container ones um, for service assurance. That was one key piece. The other one I mentioned was the hardware underneath and how we actually drive APIs right down to the BIOS for the Dells, the HPs, the Lenovo's that use this technology, right, to GPUs, ASICs um, underneath. This really improves that flexibility to automate things and use CICD type pipelines for infrastructure as code together. And this is where we work together to actually invest together in labs, where we can actually build out these solutions that live on top of the platform, the same way that the operator might do that in their pre-production and actual production environments. This actually accelerates how fast they can deploy new applications, upgrade them, um, ensure they take care of security on these things and register them and actually have, you know, OpenSCAP or other technologies for vulnerability scanning built into that process. This driving a much faster way they drive those applications from many third parties, you know, the network partners, their application vendors, their AIML vendors, um, and additional partners for various industries. So this is really kind of what drives the, uh, the speed at which our customers can, can work together um, through this partnership with Intel. Uh, 5G is, I mean, it's not a new New jargon, new term, but it's still a kind of a emerging space in from many uh, perspectives. What kind of ecosystem are you seeing will evolve, or do you see that already we have a you know set of networking ecosystem is already there, which will further grow, or you see there will be a new breed of either vendors or players who will be entering this space, which will also lead to my second question, which will be that uh, how are we? by we, I mean enterprise customer going to commercialize or going to leverage these 5G technology because the capabilities that 5G is going to offer is being beyond our comprehensions, especially uh, if you look at edge computing, because edge is not just about IoT devices, it's also about data center on edge. So, so there's so much uh, we can talk about. So let's start with the evolution of the ecosystem in the 5G space. And then I would love to talk about, you know, um, edge, how you see enterprise customers going to leverage edge. Um, so we have the incumbent vendors for 5G that were the same ones we had for 4G for both the core and the radio and, they, and 5G kind of drives an expectation of it all being cloud native and that we have ways through open RAN to make this an interoperable approach and as a result we've got some new players that have come to market in both the core and the RAN for 5G so that's just in the network portion. 
but there's always new things coming along in terms of how we actually improve observability, security. These are all the applications that sit on top of the platform to help you manage it and secure it. And these ones have to have what we call lifecycle management along with all the network elements. And this is where yet another open source technology from the Kubernetes side called an operator framework allows us to lifecycle manage any application, be it network oriented, be it security oriented on top of the platform so that customers can actually you know, add scale um, and change this on the fly using a consistent mechanism. And as we expand into what's known as Mac or Enterprise Edge, we'll do the same thing for those, I'll call them the OT and IT applications that are gonna sit on top of this. And now your partner ecosystem extends into sort of the Bosch, you know, Schlumberger and those parts of the world for manufacturing edge, auto factories, retail consumer. So this is kind of how this expands into a common set of systems across the IT side of the house where the data lakes might live in public clouds or private clouds, all the way up to the edges to the plants and the industrial edge itself. So I think uh, Ian articulated it really well, right? Uh, and I think um, just to add to that, what we're seeing is um, you know, a, a multiplier effect, right? You're seeing not only the advent or rise of 5G, you're seeing, you know, this very strong emergence of edge computing. Uh, and then you're also seeing kind of the pervasiveness of AI or analytics. So combining all of these things together uh, is really going to ha have an, a multiplier effect, which is going to drive significant, you know, impact um, to the to a variety of businesses in various vertical industries, you're seeing a convergence of not only these workloads, you know, five G, edge, AI, but they're also, you know, convergence with the industry specific workloads, like Ian mentioned, you know, smart manufacturing, smart city, um, healthcare, retail. So there's a convergence of all of these workloads um, at the edge um, for these enterprises. And that really also requires a very robust network infrastructure and very automated, you know, cloud to edge um, infrastructure in order to support, uh, you know, support these enterprises as well as these convergence of these workloads at the edge. So the ecosystem is really going to grow in some ways. We're at the tip of the iceberg. But then you're also going to see, you know, convergence of workloads where you might see an AI-based company working with a telco operator um, as well as a telecom equipment manufacturer and then partners, technology partners like Red Hat and Intel. So you're really going to see kind of a very combinatorial ecosystem that really needs to work together to deliver these use cases. One more thing that I just want to have your, since you are here, is that after this pandemic, a lot of things have changed. Not only how we are building our infrastructure, it's also about how we are working and more and more people are working remotely. It will also, uh, that uh, because of all the latencies, a lot of organizations will start moving a lot of workload near where their employees are. A lot of things will change. Uh, and where 5G and Edge is going to play a big role. It's not just about pandemic, it will become a norm how we work. So do you also see any role of uh, edge computing and 5G as these technologies mature and as the market also changes? Because even if it is 2021, even if the vaccine is here, we don't see that people are suddenly start rushing back to offices. No, so kind of what uh, what I see with, you know, the, the new normal as we, you know, I've been working from home for a long, long time. So there's not really a big change just as to where I might be. Um, but I think the fact that many more people are now able to work from home, that drives a need to, from a security perspective, find ways that they can still work from home, get the services they need in a secure fashion. So now we're going to see sort of the convergence of your consumer broadband with your home VPN access and try and solve that problem. Then we got to determine where do we actually, you know, do the, you know, compute of that data. What Rina was talking about, the data processing at the edge for those applications. So we are going to see kind of a, a a broader push to the edge. And the good news is that you know, five G is distributed in its own right and allows us to kind of expand that capability. And many of the operators have kind of figured out that this is how they can kind of drive better economics for how they deliver their services. And the other thing we're going to see. And we've already seen it. It hasn't, you know, it's already happened. It's already in place. Is that the hyperscalers have come to play to participate in delivering these services at the edge in, you know, in conjunction and in partnership 
with the op with the operators, with other systems integrators, to make it so that you can deliver and process data and workloads, not just you know in big clouds that they are used to building or on the private clouds of the enterprise, but also at the factory on premise and at edge locations at the telco. So this is going to become a you know a key piece of work we need to do, which is to make it secure and easy to move workloads and data processing, AI, you know, those kind of things, wherever that workload might live. And this is kind of the, another part of the work that we're doing together between Red Hat and Intel is building on these APIs that live on the top of the system, API gateway management across public, private, and edge clouds. And Renu, while you answered that question, I would also love if you can share some use cases that you have seen because of this change, Danny, because you know, as a hardware vendor, you have access to a lot of those use cases as well. Yeah, absolutely, um, Swapnal. We have some, um, just in the last year, you know, because of you know, the pandemic uh, situation mm -hmm. we're in, um, we actually saw a surge in healthcare use cases. So, so normally, you know, healthcare was very much a um, in the cloud, in the public cloud, or in a you know a private cloud type of um, uh, use case. Uh, what we saw was uh, a need for edge computing around healthcare. Uh, there is so much of metadata from a um, you know from the healthcare use case perspective for diagnosis of of diseases what they realized was that not all of that metadata really needed to be processed. So, so they, they were going to process, they processed the uh, dat data at the edge uh, and then only transfer what they really need to the cloud. Um, so there is not only faster response time because now you're processing the data at the edge, but you're also saving on bandwidth because you're not, you don't need to transmit everything to the cloud. So, so there has been actually a surge in healthcare use cases. And, and a lot of the healthcare institutions are also, you know, infrastructure challenge. So they are looking at different ways to expand their infrastructure by processing this data at the edge. And more importantly, they're very concerned with data sovereignty, which is security and privacy of the patient data, which is another reason for why they're really looking at edge computing, on-premise edge computing, as a way to um, help uh, secure um, the patient data. So far, we have talked about you know the engagement you know at a higher level. Can you talk about how <laughs> Red Hat and Intel's engineers and teams are actually collaborating? Uh, are you doing everything virtual? Or do you have you know physical labs somewhere where you come? I I, I don't know if you are uh, doing anything too much in person, but can you talk about the actual engagement between the engineers and developers of these two companies? Well, I would say that most of the engagement at an engineering level and even the work we do in the labs is done in virtual mode. You now it's very you now because we have effectively you know, we got to send some people and actually go set up the lab itself. But the actual engineers who access this access it securely, you know, in a virtual fashion, right? And this is how we work with many of our customers and partners is in a virtual fashion, and we have access to technology that we can spin up, and we have, you know we basically safely send the right people in to go get you know the physical hardware set up. But once we've got it sort of basically set up and a secure way to access it. Then our engineers can collaborate you know, in the labs virtually, if you will, as well as in engineering meetings that they have you know, around the world because our teams are distributed globally, both for Red Hat and Intel. Um, and so as a result, this is how we, how we continue to work is in a, a virtual fashion, taking advantage of a lab. It doesn't really matter where that lab is. It just happened to be where the real estate was for us to take use of it. To expand on what Ian said, right? I mean, that is a what we call a remote access secure lab infrastructure. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great way for us to not only build on our joint technologies. So, for as an example, our lab infrastructure will have not only our you know latest Xeon processors, but also our Ethernet adapters. It will have you know our software uh, toolkits, like it will have our uh, Flex RAN um, reference software for Access Edge or Virtualized RAN. It will have our OpenNest toolkit, which is Open Network Edge Services software. And then also what Ian mentioned, which was, hey, we will have some of our new capabilities like our Kubernetes operators or our some of our security extensions. All of this will be in, the, in an infrastructure located in the lab 
it will have you know some of our um, uh, you know like red hat open shift or other red hat uh, you know the rel operating system and others so all of this in the uh, uh, lab infrastructure and then we have you know various virtual network function or cloud native network function isvs who can remotely access this infrastructure they can optimize their solutions they can validate it and they can also be certified which in turn you know allows them to you know increase or accelerate their time to market or even for our customers if we say hey here is an ecosystem of vnfs and cnfs that have been validated on our infrastructure um, you know take this for your production and uh, deployment our customers are really happy about that because this really helps reduce their time to validation or their effort or their r and d effort for validation and if i could add to that uh, uh, renew just the the other piece of that is that the repositories of the software from the third parties, right? Those are secure repositories. We bring them in the same way as we would as if we were the customer building this through a CI CD pipeline, test and validate it, run it through the processes, make sure it gets, you know, scanned appropriately through a registry software. And this looks and feels very much like a customer environment of how they would run a infrastructure as code CI CD pipeline for their builds in their production. This is really what drives down the cost of how we do things by having built a similar approach and best practices with multiple vendors in a common lab environment. I'm assuming that, you know, of course, almost all of the work that you folks are doing there is open source, but can you share, you know, what kind of open source, either code base or resources are available, not only for the community to, to uh, access the work, but also to get involved? So I think, um, um, you know, a number of different, um, we, we've been partnering on a number of different open source projects. I think um, uh, we have not only the, um, uh, you know, Kubernetes, various Kubernetes projects, uh, we have some very specific even networking projects within that, like Multis, SRIOV. Uh, we have partnerships even for our data plane projects like DPDK. Um, all of these different, you know, projects um, uh, in the Linux Foundation, as well as in the, the kind of the CNCF, um, uh, Kubernetes uh, environment, we are partnering with, uh, you know, Red Hat uh, and in, in order to not only ensure we are upstreaming it in the right manner so that, you know, Red Hat can then downstream into their um, commercial pro uh, projects. And I think in many instances, we are, uh, we are, you know, collaborating where, you know, Red Hat and Intel are jointly on a number of the, uh, the technical committees, as well as, um, you know, we are part of the committees that, you know, review and approve um, the contributions. And so we're not only contributing, but we're in the community working together as well. Even the process by which we actually do the work um, that's a CNTT project, right, for doing onboarding of VNFs and CNFs into the system. So that's one of the projects. It's actually tied to GSMA um, for that portion of it. Um, Renew already talked about OpenS, which is how you actually drive workloads to the different hardware underneath. These are very specific ones. Then we go to the Open RAN Alliance, or O-RAN, and that's where we work on different working groups in there to take the technologies to drive those open interfaces drive the orchestration in a common way. And this is how other parties come to come to work with us as well as our customers, right? Because these are key things that um, the operators are very much interested in doing this. Things like the operator platform project in GSMA for, for MEC. These are other places where um, we work together, Intel, Red Hat, and our um, partners and customers um, to drive 5G and edge um, in the industry. Renu, Ian, thank you so much for taking time out from your schedule today and talk about not only this partnership, but also we went deeper into how the ecosystem is evolving, how 5G and you know, Edge are going to play a very big role, how enterprise can leverage these technologies. Uh, I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Swapnil, and it was great partnering with Ian. So look forward to continuing to partner with Red Hat. And uh, thanks again for uh, taking the time with us today and uh, look forward to more uh, discussions and more engagement as we you know, innovate further in the, in the industry.